before combat aircraft enter hostile territory, electronic warfare teams are the first to fly into the danger zone. By attacking an enemy's air defense system, electronic warfare destroys an opponent's ability to see. In modern air combat, radar is the principal means of detecting and downing enemy aircraft. Ground-based radar systems locate aircraft and then vector fighters to intercept and eliminate them. Even if the aircraft pass through the barrier of fighters, they encounter a defensive wall of radar-guided munitions. In order for aircraft to survive in this deadly arena, enemy radars must be suppressed. This is the function of electronic warfare. Electronic warfare aims to blind the enemy by jamming or destroying their radars, crippling their ability to defend themselves. The US began using airborne electronic warfare in World War II sending specially modified aircraft called ferrets to detect enemy radar sites. These electronic reconnaissance missions were a valuable addition to the Allied tactical air effort, and ferret aircraft would continue to fly throughout the Cold War. During the Vietnam War, the enemy's use of sophisticated radar systems posed an enormous threat to U.S. aircraft. In response, the U.S. formed electronic warfare units called Wild Weasels, a name derived from their ferret ancestors. Unlike the ferrets, the Wild Weasels not only located enemy radars, but attacked them as well. It was the Wild Weasel variants of the F-105 that assumed the bulk of the anti-radar missions over Vietnam. In modern air warfare, several different types of aircraft perform an attack mission, working in unison in what is called a strike package. The strike package includes attack aircraft to deliver bombs against targets, fighters to defend package aircraft from enemy fighters, and finally, the electronic warfare aircraft, which provides protection against any radar-guided threats. Our job is to support other strike packages. People have to realize that electronic warfare is what the guys in the Pentagon and, and the bigger guys like to call a force multiplier. If we were to send a package by itself into a specific target area without electronic uh, warfare support, their uh, rate of destruction or their rate of being engaged by the enemy is astronomical versus when we're on station doing our job taking out the enemy's eyes, uh, it being extremely low. The electronic warfare component of a strike package is based on a triad of aircraft. Wild weasels such as the F-4 Phantom and the F-16 Fighting Falcon attack and destroy radar sites directly with weapons. Jammer aircraft attack enemy radar systems electronically. The jamming role was fulfilled by the EF-111 Ravens until 1995 and is now handled by the EA-6B Prowler aircraft. 
The final element of the electronic warfare triad is the EC-130 compass call, which jams the enemy communication nets that connect the radars to the enemy missile batteries. Each of these elements play a vital role on the battlefield. Its importance, of course, can't be understated. Without us, there'll be unacceptable losses on the part of other ground attack aircraft or penetrating interdiction type aircraft. You're on it. That's just right the mission of wild weasel pilots is one of the most dangerous in the field of tactical air power. The wild weasel motto, first in, last out, tells the story. The wild weasels will be the first element of the strike package to enter enemy airspace, paving the way for the attack force. And they will be the last to leave, acting as a defensive electronic rear guard. We go out uh, to a, an assigned area, to our target area. Uh, we usually go out there first and uh, ahead of a package. Uh, and uh, our job is to locate those radars and bring them down, suppress the radars, kill them if we can. The other airplanes are dependent on us to keep those SAMs down for them as they go through uh, to their targets. So we're out there on the front line uh, for most of the time uh, while we're flying. After the Vietnam War, equipment changed, but the Wild Weasel mission remained the same. The F-4 Phantom had been the U.S. Air Force's primary fighter aircraft in Vietnam. With the arrival of the F-15 Eagle Fighter in the late 1970s, the Phantoms switched roles, becoming Wild Weasels instead. As aircraft technology improved, the equipment changed once again. The last use of an F-4 as a wild weasel was over southern Iraq in January 1996. Today, the wild weasel role has been filled by the F-16 CJ Fighting Falcon. The Falcon is an ideal successor to the F-4 Phantom, well suited to the electronic warfare role. While it is not as large an aircraft, it is capable of carrying the many electronic sensors needed to detect enemy radar emissions. As with the Phantom, the fly-by-wire flight controls of the F-16 reduce the need for a second crewman. This places a tremendous workload on the Falcon pilot. Not only must he pilot the aircraft into the target area and return safely, avoiding terrain when flying at low levels, but he must also search for air to ground targets and be aware of any airborne threats that might sneak up. The wild weasel pilot thrives in the suppression of enemy air defenses. He's an aviator who can intimidate by mere presence and devastate an enemy's defenses. In the early 1980s, the F-4 was the only wild weasel aircraft. A pair of F-4s would work as a hunter-killer team. Specially modified F-4Gs acted as the hunter, sniffing out enemy radars, while F-4E fighters carried the weapons to attack the radars. F-16s first replaced the killers, serving alongside F-4G Phantoms in the hunter role. The smaller F-16 was more agile than the older F-4, and better able to defend the hunter-killer team against enemy fighters. This configuration, despite its advantages, took some adjustment. I think the hardest part for me to transition to that was trying to transition to the relative size and the difference. And when you start flying with F-4s and other F-4s, you, you learn to visualize the turns and how fast they can turn and how quickly they can react. When you first start flying with an F-16 that's got an instantaneous turn rate, an instantaneous acceleration, you can no longer predict like you used to with other aircraft where he's going to end up. And he's significantly smaller than we are, so that makes it very hard to keep him in sight, especially in weather where the visibility may be very low or the cloud decks. And so if you start pushing him out too far, it gets to be very challenging to keep him in position where he can react quickly to threats behind you 
threats that may be shooting at you or to get him into position where he can employ his ordnance. It was improvements to the F-16 and advances in electronics that finally led the Air Force to retire the F-4G, replacing it with the F-16CJ, which now serves as both hunter and killer. The F-16CJ's offensive punch comes from the AGM-88 Harm missiles it carries. It also carries a Harm targeting system which allows the wild weasel pilot to fire his harm missiles from longer range and with greater accuracy. When it is not accompanied by an EA-6B prowler, the F-16CJ can also carry an electronic jamming pod for self-protection. The environment of the Wild Weasel mission is different from that of other fighters. The Wild Weasels often operate at very low altitudes, using terrain features such as hills and trees to mask their aircraft from enemy radars. Flying low to the ground is uh, and it's exciting in its own right just because of the rush of the ground going by you. Um, flying air to air though is, to me, that's what a fighter pilot really is. Uh, I enjoy flying air to ground though because it offers me a chance to diversify and, and uh, it keeps all my skills home, air to air and air to ground, because you have to do both to win the war. The F-16 suitability to the Wild Weasel mission is due to its particular virtues. It is a small, very agile fighter, ideally suited to either dogfighting or treetop level attack. Because the wild weasels will be at the very tip of an attacking strike package, they have to be able to defend themselves against enemy fighters. In order to get to the target area, you're gonna to have to fight your way there, and uh, part of that is, uh, uh, is uh, flying air to air and uh, defending yourself, and uh, if necessary, be offensive uh, in order to get to the target area. We do quite a bit of air-to-air -air training. A squadron on a hull is oh, anywhere from 30 to 50 percent of our sorties would be a, a ballpark figure. Air-to-air uh, -air training is, of course, uh, basic to any kind of uh, application of aerial tactics. If you can fly a good air-to-air -air sortie, then you'll probably be able to do other missions very well. The F-16 Falcon is much more sophisticated than the older F-4 Phantom it replaced. The Falcon was the first combat aircraft to employ fly-by-wire controls, a method of flight controls relying on computer-assisted stabilization instead of the conventional mechanical and hydraulic systems. Not surprisingly, the F-16 was dubbed the electric jet. We call it the last of the sports models. It's uh, extremely easy to fly. Uh, very sophisticated electronics, avionics suite make it uh, a system that doesn't require a whole lot of attention on the part of the pilot to, to flying the airplane. It gives us a lot of uh, freedom to be looking outside and working on the, the tactical portion of our mission rather than on trying to fly the airplane itself. It is an age-old rule of air combat that it is the enemy you can't see who is your greatest threat. For this reason, the F-16 was designed to give the pilot unparalleled visibility from the cockpit. You get an excellent view. Uh, the way you're sitting out here, you, you really can't even see your wings, so you have an incredible amount of uh, field of view around you, either to your right, to your left, and in front of you, and even behind you, because you're sitting above most of the, most of the fuselage of the aircraft. So it, it offers you the best view of any aircraft uh, in the Air Force now. Well, it's different than most airplanes in that you don't really sit inside it, you sit on top of it. There's very little airplane around you, and the canopy rails are, in fact, down around your hips. So you have a sensation of being out in space all by yourself. We think of it as being on the tip of a pencil, and you, it's almost like the airplane is attached to you. Uh, because of the nature of the flight controls, uh, fly-by-wire, a stick that doesn't move, you have the sensation of thinking the airplane instead of flying, and it's so responsive. If you want to go somewhere, it does it. So it's very easy to fly.
The complexity of wild weasel missions, even during peacetime training exercises, requires considerable preparation. Okay, I've got uh, 20 seconds to teach Each this. mission begins with a pre-flight briefing. Our mission today is uh, to support strikers who are going to be uh, passing through our target area. We want to suppress threats for a 10-minute uh, period and uh, just briefly want to do a corridor ops for, for that entire 10-minute TOS. I'll set up the scenario so that uh, we go wild weasel versus fighter. I'll designate that, I'll designate the blot so that we're avoiding each other by a thousand feet. Okay, uh, now in the target area, Craig. Uh, we're facing a divisional size uh, threat array with all the associated radars and uh, surface to air missiles, AAA. Okay, things, remember, uh, fence check, enter in the target area, think about the threat. As soon as we hit 51, heading up towards the north there, we plan to stimulate the threat. Uh, we'll drive straight at them into about uh, 10 miles. Shot timing, uh, we want to space our shots uh, to cover our time on station. We've got 10 minutes in the area and uh, want to be getting missiles off uh, to cover that whole period. First one we'll call a kilo type attack, basically in trail shot. Uh, you'll see us turn inbound to the threat with no other visual signals. You'll end up in about a one to two mile trail there. The preparatory signal for the shot is a wing rock. Okay, when you see the wing rock, go ahead and set your switches for primary threat if we break left and secondary threat if we break right. The wild weasel can significantly impact the success or failure of a mission because we are the only unit around, we are the only type of aircraft or system available in the world now that can go after these mobile emitters and these mobile uh, AAA and SAM sites, pick them out, identify them, and either take them out with our missiles or else send in some other aggressors to take them out as well. Uh, the strike package is going to try to punch a hole in there, and that's kind of what we want to try to do is open the hole, make it safer for them to pass through and then come on back. We're the first ones in, we do, we can protect ourselves air to air. We're the last ones out, again, we can protect ourselves. However, it's a little discomforting to go in there without any other air assets guarding you and to come out behind everybody else, including any stragglers that they may have or somebody who's sustained battle damage. Because although we're going to try to protect ourselves, given a chance, we'll try to protect anybody who's coming out that's on our side. Uh, so it uh, makes for a lot of, uh, a lot of work. We'll take as many harms in the battle as we can. The harm is, uh, we like to call it, one of those wish you were dead weapons. Because once it comes off the rail, if uh, the emitter is still up there and, and emitting at the time it comes into impact, the harm will not only destroy it explosively, and in some instances has been known to spear the radar antenna itself, it's that accurate. So we will take as many harms out there as we can. Being a good wild weasel crew, you have to be able to talk and coordinate, and there's just so much going on. And, and all the TAF, I think it's probably the single hardest job that there is to be very good at it, because you just have to know so much. Not only do we use everybody else's ordinance, but we use our own, and so we have to know everything about all of that, as well as all the threat systems as well. There is more than one way to handle enemy radars. Wild weasels destroy enemy radars one at a time. It is often critical to blind large numbers of enemy radars, even if only temporarily. Electronic jamming aircraft emit powerful bursts of energy that flood the antennas of enemy radars, making it impossible for them to distinguish targets. For this role, the U.S. Air Force deployed specialized variants of F-111 strike aircraft, called EF-111 Ravens. It's the aircraft that takes out the enemy's eyes. Uh, we jam the radars. The wild weasels hit the radars with missiles, and the uh, compass call basically takes out the communication links uh, that the enemy uh, has set up. We will go out and uh, orbit off uh, in, in an area where the uh, strikers are going to go in and drop their bombs. And at whatever the frequencies of those specific radars are, we will jam just some random frequencies and noise. And uh, hopefully, by doing this, the scopes of the enemy radars will become so cluttered up that they won't be able to pick out where the strikers are. 
As with the wild weasels, the equipment has evolved, but the role remains the same. Electronic jamming is now the job of the EA-6B Prowler. Whereas the EF-111 Raven had a crew of two, the Prowler has four. One pilot and three electronic countermeasure officers who operate the tactical jamming system, as well as the harm missiles carried for enemy surface-to-air radar suppression and destruction. Prowlers operate at higher altitudes, so their jamming systems will cover a wide area below them. The EC-130H Compass Call aircraft provides a non-lethal means of denying and disrupting enemy communication systems, degrading their combat capability and reducing losses to friendly forces. Specifically, the modified C-130 aircraft uses noise jamming to prevent or degrade the transfer of information essential to command and control of weapon systems and other resources. The Compass Call has a crew of 13, only four of whom pilot and navigate the plane. To support a strike package during its attack, the wild weasels will go in first to destroy particularly dangerous radar sites. The prowlers will orbit near the attack area, broadcasting jamming signals at the remaining radar sites. Other jamming aircraft, such as the Compass Call, will come in as the third leg of the electronic warfare triad to jam the radio links between radar sites and command centers. The mission of electronic warfare pilots may not seem as glamorous as that of fighter pilots. Their aircraft lack the offensive punch of attack aircraft. But it is the electronic wizardry of the wild weasels, prowlers, and compass calls that can make the critical difference between defeat and victory in modern air combat.